The views and opinions expressed on Reasonably Speaking are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of the American Law Institute or the speakers' organizations. The content presented in this broadcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered legal advice. Please be advised that episodes of Reasonably Speaking explore complex and often sensitive legal topics and may contain mature content. Today, I'm happy to welcome Matthew Fletcher and Winona Single. Both Matthew and Winona are professors at Michigan State University College of Law, where Matthew serves as the director of the Indigenous Law and Policy Center. Winona is currently on leave for Michigan State for two years to work as deputy legal counsel to Governor Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan. Matthew and Winona are married. On other episodes, I've provided a deeper background on our experts, but this time, I'd like to turn it over to Matthew and Winona to talk a bit more about their backgrounds. So... Welcome, Winona Matthew. Thank you for joining me. Both of you are particularly well positioned to talk about what we're here to talk about today, which is American Indian law. Can you tell me and the listeners a little bit about your particular backgrounds? Yes, absolutely. So I am from Michigan, and I'm also a tribal member. Um, I'm a citizen of one of Michigan's federally recognized tribes, Little Traverse Bay Bands. And uh, and so, in terms of my background, I. Uh, I uh, grew up in the Detroit area and really grew up without access to or knowing any attorneys, um, but very interested in law and social justice and uh, ended up becoming the first in my family to go to college, went to Harvard for my bachelor's degree and went to Harvard Law School and was very interested in working in the area of Indian law and working in a way that would contribute to tribal communities in Michigan and elsewhere. I'm Matthew Fletcher. I'm also from Michigan, but from Western Michigan, a more rural part of the state. Um, I'm a member of an Indian tribe as well, the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians, which was pretty closely related to Little Traverse, or Little T as we call it. And uh, I always say Grand Traverse Band members are the ones that got kicked out of over at Little T. So. Mm-hmm. Um, I went, I didn't know very many lawyers when I was growing up either, but, um, I did know a couple and, uh, it was nice to be able to, uh, talk to them, especially as I got older and went into law school. But, um, I am currently a law professor. I used to work in house for various Indian tribes. Probably the longest stint I had was with my own tribe, Grand Traverse Band. And that's where I, that during that period of time, I actually met Winona. And uh, now, as a law professor, I sit on a bunch of appellate courts for Indian tribes. So um, four in Michigan and three or four elsewhere outside of, of, of Michigan. Yeah, and um, both of us have had experience working with tribal courts. And I served as an appellate justice for my own tribe's appellate court for 13 years. And so I think that that was also a really important experience that where I felt I was contributing to the legal development of my tribe's um, legal system, but also I felt that that grounded me in the actual kinds of issues that our community was facing me as I began working in academia. How many appellate opinions do you think you wrote for Little Travers? A few dozen, yeah. not a huge amount. That's a lot. <laughs> probably around maybe 36, so yeah. <laughs> appellate courts that serve tribal communities their work really depends on the size of the tribe. And so our tribe has 3,500 members. So for a community of that size, we have, I think it's pretty typical to only have a few cases a year that reach the actual, that reach the appellate level. And so um, I always thought of my tribe was pretty litigious, actually. <laughs> so there are some tribal appellate courts where many years will go by without a single case being appealed to the appellate no, court. No, that's true. I sit on the Pogagan Pan Potawatomi Court, and we've had two appeals since 2002. So I hope that's because the trial judges are doing a good job, but maybe that they just don't trust their appellate court. I don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Well, it's, a, it's a really good point, too, that as an appellate court judge, you're not seeing it unless it, it goes up for appeal. Right. Um, but the interesting thing is you were on those appellate courts, and then there's also the U.S. law and the federal system. And so I think a lot, most people do recognize that, that there is the, the U.S. and then the Indian tribes, and the Indian tribes actually do operate as sovereign nations. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know that people really understand the nitty-gritty of that, what that actually means. Can you talk to me a little bit about what it means to be sovereign? How do tribes, states, and the federal government operate in that relationship? Sure. Well, I don't mind starting, and then you can pitch in, Matthew, as you uh, would like to. But tribes 
Indian tribes in the United States, they possess uh, powers of sovereignty that are inherent and that uh, predate the existence of the United States that extend um, back in time to time immemorial. And so these are powers of self-governance, of self-determination that they've always exercised. And those, that inherent sovereignty um, has never been fully lost, although it has been diminished over time through acts of Congress um, and through treaties. And so what we see is um, it's a really unique context where tribes um, possess this inherent sovereignty. It's not a gift or delegation of federal power in any way. Um, so that's uh, important to note. And again, also another important concept is that in, um, in the legal system, we think of the Constitution as uh, describing and enumerating powers of um, the various branches of government. And the Constitution does not really describe the scope and content of tribal sovereignty. It's really outside the scope of the Constitution itself. What it does do is it allocates authority to Congress to regulate commerce with uh, the Indian tribes as well as with the states and foreign nations. And so that Indian Commerce Clause has, is, serves as the foundation for what is also understood in Indian law as Congress's plenary power in Indian affairs to legislate, to regulate Indian affairs generally. So that's uh, an important concept. But another very important concept that many may not be aware of is that the amendments to the Constitution, which impose uh, prohibitions against the, gov the federal government um, and pro prohibitions against the state governments in the 14th Amendment, um, they do not apply specifically directly to Indian tribes. And so, uh, for example, the uh, right to a grand jury trial in the uh, Fifth Amendment does not apply, uh, is not an obligation of Indian tribes to provide um, in their uh, legal systems. And so uh, this is a very important concept in general. The, so the Bill of Rights of the U.S. Constitution does not bind Indian tribes and is not enforceable directly against Indian tribes. Now, uh, you might, there of course would be many who would be surprised by that, Congress did enact legislation exercising its plenary power um, in 1968 by passing a statute called the Indian Civil Rights Act. And that statute imposes uh, many um, individual rights protections on Indian tribes, but it's not identical to the Bill of Rights. And there are some important differences. So for example, there's no prohibition against the establishment of religion out of respect for the cultural diversity uh, of tribal governments. And in addition, there's no obligation to provide uh, counsel for uh, criminal defendants um, in matters where they may be sentenced. Matthew, did you want to add anything? <laughs> uh, <laughs> on too long? No, that's all right. You just did a dissertation on constitutional law in relation to Indian tribes. It's good. Um, no, you know, the, the, there are f currently 573 federally recognized tribes and, um, in the United States. And that's, that means there's 573 different judicial and, well, governmental systems. Each of the tribes has its own choices as, as to how it wants to govern itself. And so there are some tribes that govern in a way that's very traditional, very historic. Um, their leaders are selected um, through ceremonial processes or religious processes. But most Indian tribes um, select their leadership through elections, just like in local or state or federal elections. They have people run on political parties and they get campaign donations and they take out advertisements and they get people to, to uh, work for them, and that, et cetera, et cetera. So, but each tribe has its choices as to how it's going to govern itself, select its government, and most tribes have adopted a form of constitutional rights protections, either in a written or sometimes in an unwritten constitutional format. So the thing about sovereignty for Indian tribes in the U.S. is that um, they, they, there's a place that federal Indian law recognizes for Indian people to retreat to, to, to live their lives and make their own decisions and um, really a remarkable amount, of, uh, remarkable amount of diversity in terms of how they are being um, uh, innovative and creative and just different.
And uh, I think it's it's just such an exciting area to work in. I only get a, a chance to work with a few tribes, but I'm watching a lot of, of a lot of other tribes, and it's just great to be able to see different kinds of things that they choose to do. Yeah, I think also tribal governments have <clears throat> they've survived through various phases of uh, federal policies, which were extremely assimilative and very restrictive in terms of recognizing the power of tribal governments to self-govern. And so uh, because of that, throughout the 19th century, for example, tribal legal systems were often subject to the establishment of courts of Indian offenses, where laws were adopted that were intended to prohibit, for example, the exercise of Indian religions and really to regulate intimate relations in Indian communities to force assimilation, as well as to provide for public safety. And so in the 20th century, particularly from in the more recent decades and from the late 1960s through to the present, Congress has really supported the development of tribal legal systems. And that because there was such a long period of tribes really suffering from having been dispossessed and removed in many cases from their traditional territory and really suffering from the economic consequences of colonization, when, once Congress began to invest in the development of tribal legal systems, tribes had a lot of work to do to develop their tribal codes, to develop their the operation and to invest in capacity building of their tribal legal systems, of their executive agencies. And so there's so much sort of the work of nation building has been incredibly exciting to be a part of. And that's um, something that has really developed in dramatic ways in the last 40 some years. So some rights are provided by Congress, some by the Constitution. Um, but then as sovereign nations, Indian tribes interact with the U.S. government and form treaties, contracts, like that we think about between two other countries. So there might be a treaty between the United States and Canada. Um, and I think we tend to know what that means. When we're talking about treaties between an Indian tribe and the U.S. government or a state, perhaps, does it mean the same thing? Um, and is it potentially more complicated because you're looking at an Indian tribe whose uh, boundaries, whose borders, whose lines might actually be within the greater U.S. borders. It's incredibly complicated, and it's a, a difficult thing for people to wrap their heads around if they haven't um, really thought about what it means to have this third level of sovereignty in, in, the, in the United States. Um, so yes, Indian tribes have entered into something like 400 treaties with the United States government, and those are presidentially declared they are ratified by the Senate, just like any other treaty. You know, the United States enters into treaties with Indian tribes and foreign nations, but not with states. And so that puts Indian tribes in sort of this interesting um, constitutional area that is just completely different than anything else. You're unlikely in most law schools, and this is unfortunate, to hear about this area of sovereignty, which is really important. You'll hear about state sovereignty and federal sovereignty and federalism and cooperative federalism. And then with all these cases about Indian tribes, we'll just skip over those because I don't understand them and I don't want to, as a professor, look like I don't know what I'm talking about. So you, you, I've heard that so many times from, and, and candid moments from colleagues around the country. So, mm -hmm. um, But yeah, that, those, that treaty relationship is really incredible. So yes, Indian tribes have members or citizens who are citizens of those tribes who are also American citizens. And it's really complex to know that our citizenship is sort of divided into three separate things. I mean, we are, most Americans are citizens under the 14th Amendment. They are federal and state citizens. It's an American citizenship. But federal and state citizen, citizenship for Indian people is actually split still. Um, the 14th Amendment uh, actually includes this phrase, Indians not taxed, which nobody really knows what that means. But as a matter of law, um, in theory, it means that Indian, tri Indian people who grow up on the reservation, who are 100%, or sometimes we refer to them as full-blood Indian, Indian people whose parents are both Indians, um, and they grow up on the reservation, are not automatically citizens under birthright under the 14th Amendment because of this language, Indians not taxed. Indians not taxed are not counted for purposes of proportional representation. That's still a thing in the American constitutional system.
But because of something Winona mentioned before, the 1924 Citizenship Act, so there's an act of Congress that does extend this citizenship and guarantee that citizenship to all Indians. So there really are no people, Indians not taxed right now. But if, interestingly enough, I've always wondered what would happen if Congress did repeal that statute because that's all it is, is a statute. And if you had you know, an Indian child born on the reservation, which does happen, who is full blood Indian, it does happen, and lives on that reservation, without the Citizenship Act, I don't know that they would actually be citizens. And it's a really weird situation. I mean, it's all in theory because we have the 1924 Citizenship Act and that's not gonna go anywhere, as far as we can tell, right? But it's, a, it's a possible. So one of the ways I describe it, how Indian people are, Winona's looking at me like, okay, stop talking, it's my turn oh, now. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> so but I, with, with my students, and I don't know how persuasive this is, but um, I think it's fun. I, people say things like, they're confused, like how can you be a citizen of an Indian tribe and, not, and an American citizen, but, and you have special rights or special privileges? And I say, look, Indian people are like diplomats. Think of like, we have treaties with foreign nations, and out of those treaties comes, forms a political relationship in which we allow people from another country to come to this country and be diplomats, and they have a different regime of law that applies to them. And the same is exactly true, except in, instead of foreign nations, the treaty is with Indian tribes. And we are what is called a domestic sovereign, but we're still a sovereign. We still have that political relationship with the United States. And so when you say special rights or privileges, you're ignoring the part that, yeah, there are some special rights and privileges, but there's also huge detriments. You know, the government took all our land. They took our language. They stole our kids and put them in schools. And they, they imposed legal systems on us where they said you can't you have to go to bed at six o'clock at night or we're going to prosecute you, and they had then there's they even that, those are old archaic examples but we still have things like the federalization of Indian country criminal jurisdiction means that a, a bunch of our kids are in federal penitentiaries they're the only children in federal penitentiaries, and that's all for our law law and order and our public safety and it's supposed to be for our be our benefit but. Um, so there are pluses and minuses to, to all of this. I don't think Indian people want it, or any Indian tribes are trying to get out of that relationship because it's something we can build from to try to restore our cultures and our, our, our languages and everything. But um, it's not, it's not, it's, it's really interesting as a legal perspective. I, I love working in this area. Yeah, I just want to add to what you're saying, Matthew, um, that when you look at this body of 400 plus treaties, it's so important to note that in the absence of the Constitution addressing in any comprehensive way what Indian tribes are, what their powers of sovereignty include, treaties, those treaties form the constitutive documents that address um, the tribe's government to government relationship with the United States as sovereign to sovereigns and they also recognize collectively and individually, they recognize the inherent sovereignty of Indian tribes and powers of tribal self-governance. And um, in addition, treaties are not um, documents of, of the past with no relevance to the future. They absolutely are um, enforceable today, and they um, are a source not just of principles that affirm tribal inherent sovereignty, um, but they also um, provide for specific um, treaty rights um, in many cases with regard to hunting, fishing, and gathering that are critical for tribes. And they also are an, a very important means of tribes being able to maintain their connection to their territory in a way that's important for economic purposes, but I would say even more important for tribes to continue to be that to live in a way that is consistent with their culture, to be capable of participating in the activities that are integral to their culture and religion, and to be, in, to be Indian people, to live as Indian people. And so I think that um, that's absolutely critical. And there are many, um, an, an important principle to note with regard to treaties also is the reserved rights doctrine, which is that tr we look to treaties to understand what tribes have relinquished, whether that's territory or specific uh, rights. But anything that is not explicitly relinquished in a treaty is presumed to be retained, a retained power of the tribe. So um, treaty rights are important because they also provide rights not just um, uh, within the reservations that treaties often created, but they include uh, a recognition in many cases that tribes, 
uh, also have off-reservation treaty rights to hunt and gather and fish in that territory that has been ceded or relinquished. And so that's critical and the subject of a massive amount of litigation in many contexts as well. So when treaties don't set the rules, courts may. That creates the question of jurisdiction over any claim or criminal charge. Will you tell me about the history of tribes' jurisdiction over tribal and non-tribal members and some of the more recent changes in the laws? Yeah. How about I talk about the, how we got there? And right, since Matthew was a tribal attorney for the Suquamish tribe, and so I think it would be great if you spoke <laughs> yeah. about all, all of right. the Suquamish tribe. And then I'll well, I was going to go about. way back further than that. So. Oh. <laughs> the, very, the very first act of Congress in Indian Affairs was the Trade and Intercourse Act of 1790 and it preempted any state criminal jurisdiction over Indian country. So it left alone the ability of tribes to handle their own law, law enforcement on the reservation, excepting that if an American citizen went into Indian country, the United States government would have jurisdiction over any crimes committed by that person. And even going into Indian country in 1790 was a violation of the law. You couldn't even go there. So fast forward 150, 160, 170 years, you still have that same regime in most parts of Indian country where the state government does not have jurisdiction over crimes that occur on the reservation. And so it's the federal government that takes primary jurisdiction over those cases. Now think of your average United States Attorney's Office. They deal in drug trafficking and then kidnapping and bank robberies and you know international terrorism and you know, massive, in critically important federal type crimes. And then they have these non-Indians who commit misdemeanor domestic violence case uh, perpetrators. And, you know, they have these non-Indians who are committing po even poaching of tribal game and, you know, s stealing fish and, you know, stealing tribal resources, that sort of thing. Um, the federal government is the one that's supposed to prosecute those cases. And, uh, you know, and the tribes in the 1960s and 70s really started to develop their criminal justice systems and they started to sort of westernize how they were going to prosecute crimes. And so a few of them um, tentatively began trying to prosecute non-Indians for some of these crimes. And of course that's the kind of case that goes to the Supreme Court. And I used to work on the Suquamish Reservation, which is the home to what is known as Chief Seattle Days. It's their big party of the year. It's their big powwow that they have every summer. And uh, in the early 1970s, a couple of white guys came out of the reservation and got drunk and disorderly and had a high-speed chase on the reservation with tribal police officers. They rammed a tribal roadblock. Um, it was just, I mean, luckily nobody was, as far as I can tell, seriously injured, but it was a crime against, directly against the tribe and um, their brand new tribal police cars. And uh, so they prosecuted. And it got to the Supreme Court and they said, of course tribes don't have the power to prosecute non-Indians. Are you crazy? And uh, you know, we're all looking, I mean, I'm relating back because this, I'm a little kid when this case is decided, but I can imagine somebody looking around the courtroom saying, so of course, if tribes can't prosecute non-Indians, what's, what's the source of law for this pro proposition? And the Supreme Court in 1978 in Oliphant versus Suquamish tribe said, it was an un literally is an unspoken assumption by all of the players. Tribes assumed they couldn't do it. The United States government assumed they couldn't do it. Therefore, can't do it. And it's one of the more surreal uh, constitutional law cases you can ever read. It's one of those cases that nobody really likes to teach unless they have to teach Indian law because it makes no sense. There are no sources of the, no provisions in the Constitution that li limit the tribal powers. There, there was no act of Congress that expressly limited tribal powers. I mean, you can make some assumptions, as the court did, about what Congress is legislating about, even as far back as that first Trade and Intercourse Act. And that's, that really gutted the ability of tribes to respond to simple crimes. You know, somebody gets, you know, does a reckless driving on the reservation who's a non-Indian. Um, the real world, uh, the United States Attorney's Office isn't going to handle that case. They're not going to prosecute a misdemeanor like that. And it turned out over the course of the years that followed Oliphant, the decision in 1978, until the early part of the 21st century, as crime rates around the United States, in every demographic and every geographic region in the United States were precipitously declining, especially beginning in the 1990s, they were going in the exact opposite direction in Indian country. Because in so many places in Indian country where a tribe cannot prosecute a non-Indian, uh, the United States government's declination rate 
for cases that were referred to them, usually by the tribes, was over 90%, although nobody knew exactly because the U.S. Attorney's offices were not reporting and didn't have to report how many cases were referred to them and how many had declined. But basically, in some places, it was just straight up 100%. And it wasn't just those misdemeanors. You know what happens in a domestic violence situation is it starts with yelling and screaming and throwing of plates. And then the next time around, and then maybe, maybe the perpetrator gets a citation. And the next time around, it's punching and fighting and kicking. And then the next time around, it's child abuse. And it just gets worse and worse and worse if it's not handled by the criminal justice system. And then we started seeing in the 90s and in the 80s these horrible, vicious attacks on women that, and, and sexual assault. And so uh, what we see is after the Oliphant decision in 1978, tribes have only have criminal jurisdiction over Indians, not over non-Indians. And then studies, then empirical studies, were able to show that 55% of Native women in Indian of Native women have experienced uh, domestic violence. And of those, 90% of them said that their perpetrator had been a non-Indian. So there's this tremendous experience of domestic violence in Indian country and tribes are powerless to prosecute the perpetrators who are uh, most likely to be non-Indian in these contexts. And so given that, there develops within Indian country a sense of impunity among many perpetrators that they can continue these acts of domestic violence without any legal consequences. The states lack jurisdiction over any crime committed by an Indian in Indian country. States only have criminal jurisdiction in Indian country and over non-Indians who commit crimes against non-Indian victims, unless the state is what we call a public law 280 state, which we won't get into right now, but that does extend uh, state criminal jurisdiction into Indian country for specified states. So uh, because the states lack jurisdiction and the tribes lack jurisdiction over non-Indian perpetrators, the uh, federal government uh, has criminal jurisdiction. But within the U.S. attorney's offices throughout the United States, domestic violence was simply not a priority. And so the rate of declination was just so, um, so significant, so large. And as a result, it created uh, terrible consequences. And so there was a push to address this. And fortunately, in 2013, Congress did reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act with a special uh, section of the statute that provided what's called uh, special uh, special criminal jurisdiction um, in Indian country um, with regard to domestic violence. This is just a patchwork way, a piecemeal way of expanding tribal criminal jurisdiction, but it does do some very important things. The um, special criminal jurisdiction recognized in the act is a recognition explicitly of tribal inherent criminal jurisdiction over Indians, over non-Indians, so that's important. Um, uh, but it's limited to instances where there's already a relationship between the perpetrator and the victim. So there must be a relationship for the tribal, for the tribe to prosecute someone who commits uh, sexual assault against Native women. So that means that there's no criminal jurisdiction if there is a, a rape, for example, committed by a non-Indian stranger to an Indian woman. No jurisdiction over that. And so the, the statute is important, but it still does not prov provide for a full public safety within Indian communities um, by uh, a more expansive recognition of tribal inherent criminal jurisdiction is necessary to accomplish that. What we have seen also is that there are, I believe, 18 tribes now which have so far um, opted to exercise the special criminal jurisdiction that's authorized under um, VAWA of 2013. And uh, for those tribes, there, there have been um, well over 100 cases that um, have arisen in, for those particular tribes. And there have been something like over 50 uh, criminal convictions of, of non-Indians within Indian country. You should mention that of, the, of that small number of tribes that actually have qualified for this extra jurisdiction, four of them are in Michigan. That's right. So, and, but there have been no prosecutions of those four yeah. tribes, and that's the, the rub here. 
Right. So there are requirements that tribes must satisfy to exercise this special criminal jurisdiction. So, for example, they must um, provide uh, counsel for indigent criminal defendants. Uh, all criminal defendants have, must have a right to counsel, and that was not required in the Indian Civil Rights Act. And so they must have the resources to provide that. And also all of the judges must be law trained judges that uh, handle these cases. And some tribal courts have uh, judges that may not be law trained. And certainly there are constitutions, for example, which require that on an appellate court, there must be at least one tribal elder. Those are the best courts, by the way. And I love so, working with tribal but, elders. And because of historic exclusion from legal education of native people, there aren't many tribal elders who have a JD. So tribes are needing to um, ensure that they can fulfill these requirements so to exercise this special criminal jurisdiction. But what we also see in looking at the tribes that have implemented this over the last five years, it gives rise to all sorts of other issues. So if, if a tribe criminally prosecutes uh, a non-Indian offender in one of these cases, what if that individual in the course of criminal prosecution commits um, an assault against a police officer? That's not covered. <laughs> Right? That's not part of the special criminal jurisdiction. And there could be the co-occurrence of other crimes in connection with this um, domestic violence. The big one so, is child abuse. Child abuse, as well as drug offenses, for example. Or there could be assault against other individuals that, where there is not an existing relationship with a Native woman. And so it, it simply has also given rise to greater uh, recognition that there's a need for tribes to be empowered with the ability to criminally prosecute these, these additional crimes as well. And uh, in more than half of the instances where there is a um, criminal prosecution of a non-Indian offender involving domestic violence, there's also evidence of um, child abuse or neglect um, that is often related, some crime involving um, the rights of children. And so uh, it's simply underscored the need for further action by Congress to provide protection and to recognize the inherent power of tribes to prosecute perpetrators of these crimes as well. I like to think that the statute isn't, wasn't designed to be a, um, a, an actual fix for a lot of these issues, but it was a chance for tribes to prove to Congress, and I think a little bit to the federal judiciary, that they can actually do this work. And that's always been the under, the, the assumption from the judiciary and from members of Congress that you can't have tribes prosecuting non-Indians because they would never give them a fair deal in court, which is really ironic given how awful it is for Indian people to be prosecuted in federal court where they will never have a jury that consists of any of their peers, any of any Indians. It's I've talked to a couple of dozen federal prosecutors over the years, and only one or two of them have ever said that they've done an Indian country case, a uh, criminal case, where there was an, an, an even one Indian on any jury. And uh, so, how ironic. The other thing about the 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 VAWA the VAWA, jur, the VAWA jurisdiction, the prosecutions under VAWA, is that the criminal defendants, those non-Indians, have better criminal procedure rights than any other defendant in the United States. So there are more than 10,000 judges in the United States that are not lawyers. People don't know that. You know, these justices of the peace and magistrates in rural counties in New York and Utah and Arizona, that, th those, aren't, those people aren't lawyers. They're handling, they have misdemeanor jurisdiction and they're, you know, there's, they're just doing their, their work. And um, so to sort of put this, these additional obligations on Indian tribes is, I'm, I'm supportive of that. Uh, I wish all, everybody would have a lawyer as a judge uh, in the United States, but what it does, it means that for the tribes that desperately need this, uh, some sort of help, these rural reservations that are very poor, that are out in the middle of nowhere, they're the ones that don't have any resources and they can't afford to take on this jurisdiction that Congress has afforded them. So, um, so you have tribes that like in Michigan, they have the resources to put together all the materials they need to do to change their laws, um, to hire the right people. <laughs> They've never actually had to prosecute any cases because they don't have the, the acute need. And then you have tribes like, you know, out in the, out in the West that just don't have those resources and nothing is being done about, about the ongoing assaults on, on Indian women.
But on occasion, you still have some of those tribes in the West that are closer to urban locations that have some resources or whatever, and are and are doing those prosecutions at the same time. So, and they've been incredibly successful so far. It's only been a few years, but as Winona said, you know, there have been dozens of prosecutions, several jury trials, and tribes have to put to impanel a jury that consists partially, at least partially, of non-Indians. And it's not easy to get non-Indians to show up to to jury. <laughs> Anybody to show up to jury duty, but if they, if the tribe doesn't have power over them, it makes it that much harder. So, um, you know, I, as an appellate judge, I've had one VAWA case, and it wasn't a criminal case, and it was something I had to learn about, because we've read, when and I, and anybody who does anything in any law knows all about the criminal jurisdiction authority under VAWA, but what I never paid any attention to was the civil authority that tribes were granted under VAWA, which is way broader. The ability to enforce personal protection orders against non-Indians um, on and off reservation for events that occurred on and off reservation, who, for non-Indians who live on or off the reservation is really quite incredible. And I actually, like I said, as an appellate judge, I had a VAWA case. It was a non-Indian woman who was uh, harassing an Indian man who lived on the reservation. And uh, which, you know, it wasn't a violent type thing. It wasn't actually no violence at play, but it was just an extensive amount of stalking and, and harassment that so she was enjoined, and the tribe's power to do so was granted, or recognized really, by Congress in the VAWA uh, statute. And when I went back and looked at the legislative history, you know, Congress was, there were members of Congress who were really not supportive of tribal criminal jurisdiction. And the funny thing was, they said the right way to empower tribes is to give them this ability to, to enforce civil personal protection orders. So. Jeff Sessions, for example, who was the attorney general up until yesterday, um, and before that was senator from Alabama, was spoke how, against uh, VAWA in a lot of ways, but especially the tribal criminal jurisdiction. He said the right way to go is to give them civil personal protection enforcement authority. So I actually quoted Jeff Sessions in the opinion I wrote <laughs> for the tribe at uh, the Nottawasepe Huron Band of Potawatomi Indians. So. Mm -hmm. And we should also note that um, the special domestic violence uh, criminal jurisdiction was not extended to Alaska. And so there's still... Oh, it was later. They, they fixed that. But originally it was right. not. Poor Alaska. <laughs> and, I mean, and so there's just um, so much work that needs to be done to provide for um, safety um, within Indian country. And unfortunately... Uh, Rehnquist, in authoring the Oliphant decision, had cited to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs um, in the 19th century and statements from the 1830s and 1880s, which had described Indian country as not consisting of areas where tribes had enacted many laws to protect the public. But unfortunately, what Chief Justice Rehnquist did is he used that to describe tribes as essentially zones of lawlessness. But in reality, it was his decision that created a form of lawlessness for Native victims of crimes perpetrated by Indians in Indian country. And because of that decision in 1978, many people have, have been the victim of crimes, and we have a, a lot of work to continue to do to provide for um, safety and um, support for Native communities. So, Violence Against Women Act? Um, is one that's been in the news lately, but one that has been another act that has been in the news really recently. Um, but it's been around for a while, but is just getting a lot of coverage now is the Indian Child Welfare Act, um, particularly because the Northern District of Texas just recently came down with a ruling, um, I believe calling it unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a good chance that listeners don't actually know what the Indian Child Welfare Act is or what it aims to protect. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about, um, you can give me a, a brief history, um, what it's meant to do, uh, what it's meant to protect against. Mm -hmm. um, and then actually, I'd love your thoughts to tell me, is, is it working? Is it working to do what it was meant to do? Mm -hmm. I'll start with some history, and then how about Matthew, if you Go ahead. Um, pitch in. The Indian Child Welfare Act, or ICWA, was passed in 1978. And it was passed because of a recognition that there was a tremendous problem of Native children being removed from their homes. And you could also 
Um, there's a long history of this, and even before intervention on the part of child welfare systems and state governments, um, there was a history in beginning in the 19th century of the establishment of Indian boarding schools. You should just talk about your family, like you can trace removals well, back five generations. In my family, I have five generations of family members where parents have lost their children due to some form of separation. And so historically, it starts with my third great grandfather who was adopted by another Native family that during the time when many Michigan Indians were fleeing forced removal in the southern part of the state. And so he moved to the Burt Lake area with this family that adopted him when he was a child. And then even in the community that he lived in, in Burt Lake, which is the northern part of the lower peninsula of Michigan, that um, their community was uh, experienced what's called the Burt Lake burnout, where the sheriff of the county and a lumber industry um, speculator um, poured kerosene in all the homes in the Indian village and burned the village to the ground. And that was also during a time when whole, there was a, a boarding school for Indian children operated by the Holy Childhood of Jesus School in Harbor Springs, Michigan. So I have family members that attended that boarding school as for multiple generations and family members that attended the Mount Pleasant Industrial Indian School in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. And so the policy of boarding schools was to assimilate Indian children, to separate them from their families so that they would not speak their language, so that they would learn English, so they would not learn Indian culture or Indian religion, but instead, um, for example, Catholic religion and the Holy Childhood School in Harbor Springs. But it was also an environment that contributed to, created a context where abuse was rampant and children, uh, there are many, many stories of both physical and sexual abuse, as well as malnutrition um, in these Indian schools. There were also some Indian families that chose to send their children to Indian boarding schools. And in fact, the leaders of the schools heavily recruited from Indian families. And so there's a combination of mixed stories about these Indian boarding schools. Some have positive stories, but some survivors will tell stories of um, various, various forms of abuse that are very, very difficult to learn about, and including um, stories of children who died while they were students at the boarding school where their deaths were not officially reported by the school. So this is a history that Michigan has, but it's one that's also common throughout the United States. And it's also a phenomenon that has occurred throughout Canada. And so in Canada, there are many, uh, there's a lot of information and research and sharing of facts related to residential schools in Canada, in large part because of the Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was intended to allow for an opportunity of sharing of experiences and facts related to this. So we have this long history of children being removed from families to attend boarding schools where they never learn the experience of um, having their parents care for them. And even in the summer times, uh, students rarely were allowed to go home. Instead, they were assigned to local families to provide housekeeping services or other services in Farm local labor. homes. And it's local Free labor. non-native families. Yes. Right, local non-native families. And uh, within the schools, they did much of the labor that was required just to keep the school in operation. So they, the, the kind of class that, for example, girls would take would include learning how to cook and learning how to do laundry and learning how to sew. And the academic part of education was minimal compared to learning these various occupations. So we have a generation of Native people who experience this loss and this trauma. Who not just one generation, but like five. Multiple generations. but uh, And then who have their own children. And um, in the eras after, for example, the Mount Pleasant Indian School had shut down, they are raising their own children. And, um, and then their children are vulnerable to being um, sort of surveilled, essentially, by child welfare services. And... Uh, statistics show that throughout the United States, one out of every four, and in some cases, one out of every three 
American Indian children in the U.S. was removed from their family and placed um, into the custody of either uh, in foster care in many cases or um, in another setting. And so even in my own family, I have generations that attended the Indian boarding schools. But then in addition, my mother was and her siblings, they were all taken from her parents um, in the 1950s um, around that time. And uh, she was uh, taken by Catholic Social Services, but then um, ultimately lived in foster care for about five years and was adopted by a non-Indian Catholic family in the Detroit area. And in fact, I mean, I think it's interesting because it kind of symbolizes the treatment of Native children at the time, but when she was assigned to uh, live with the family that wanted to adopt her, who eventually did become her adoptive parents, the um, agency brought my mother to the house and the parents were not there. So they, but they left my mother there anyway. And, the, and she actually just went to the neighbor's house for a while. So it was very informal, this trading off of children. There was no paperwork. New families. Yeah, I asked my grandmother once, if I could have her file of paperwork from this adoption. And she said, there were no papers. Of course, maybe that was her in her, you know, uh, in her old age, not recalling the details. Or not wanting to share the details. Yeah, so that was um, quite disturbing. And in fact, um, uh, just uh, shortly before it, the Indian Child Welfare Act was passed in 1978, I also was uh, about four years old, and my younger do my younger sister um, was also adopted um, under circumstances that were very coercive and unusual. Someone from the her church community in Detroit had taken her to another church in Flint and offered her for adoption to families that would want to, that might want to adopt, even though this was not the intent of my mother at all, and so. Uh, so I, of course, am very interested in ICWA and very interested in the fact that um, ICWA wasn't just trying to correct um, a terrible moment in history in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s where children were being removed from their families. It, was, it also serves as a correction and a, and a protection for Native families against a cycle of removal that had existed <laughs> through much of U.S. history. And, and this cycle is um, one that we see repeated in, in Australia, repeated in Canada, repeated in New Zealand. It's shared. Uh, it's a shared experience of indigenous people in many different contexts. And so what it does is it provides Enjoy procedural protections. Um, so I'll let Matthew take over it right here. <laughs> take a break. All right. So yeah, you, you asked if ICWA has been successful. Yes. So um, in, w in one way, it's been enormously successful. As Winona says, there are procedural protections. Primarily, ICWA is a procedural statute. And um, if you were um, a family in the United States in the 1950s and 60s, and by the way, there really were no state child welfare agencies until that time, really until after the Depression. Um, so if you were a family that, was, that had trouble, um, I don't know, we, we, we call these cases dirty homes cases now. Somebody lost their job and maybe they're devolving into a drinking and drugs and things are going bad at the house and you have lots of child neglect type issues. So the state comes and takes your kids. And um, you know, then they have an immediate emergency hearing, kind of like a probable cause hearing when you arrest somebody. You take the kids, you have a quick hearing, child welfare, um, workers testify to the judge and the judge says yes you were right to take them and and gives an order to place them temporarily in foster care or in the care of the state whatever it might be but you know what's missing what miss, was missing in those hearings before the Indian Child Welfare Act anywhere in the United States was that mom and dad who had their kids taken away from them were not given notice of that hearing and if they did happen to get notice of that hearing and show up at the hearing to try, try to defend themselves they were not allowed to cross-examine witnesses they were not allowed to testify on their own behalf. There was no ability to conduct discovery with, from the state as to what it is that, to read affidavits, to read police reports. Um, there was no right to counsel. And so you could lose your kids through the system where you don't actually have the ability to fight the, the legal processes. And once you get your kids in the system, there was little or no chance that parents would ever be able to get their kids back.
And when it comes to Indian kids, you double down on all of that because um, some states actually wrote, South Dakota had this, that is a regulation, a written piece of law that said, if you are an Indian a kid who lives on a reservation, you are by definition a child in need of care. And so if local social service workers um, in the Pine Ridge Res near the Pine Ridge Reservation, literally on just days they felt like it, would go to the local Indian school and load up the kids into a bus and take them off the reservation, they would never be seen again. Nobody would ever have noticed. The tribe wouldn't have noticed. The parents wouldn't have noticed. Those kids would be gone. And they would be intentionally moved away from Indian country because remember the state's regulation. It says living on the reservation is by definition um, child neglect. So you had formal and informal uh, assumptions about Indian parenting around the country that led to these horrible statistics. So ICWA guarantees parents the right to counsel, the right to notice, the right to the ability to contest all of these things. It used to be you could have your kids taken away from you and your rights terminated by a mere preponderance of the evidence that is more likely than not that you are a bad parent. And now under ICWA, it's, the, you have to, it's like a criminal trial. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. And because of ICWA, states began to strengthen their due process, uh, their procedural requirements for, to, to give more pr protections to those parents who are losing their kids. And um, so in that way, it's been an enormous success. A lot of states don't have the same strength of protections that ICWA does, but they're moving and have been moving in that direction. And that's a huge, a huge win for really Indian country, really for everybody to have ICWA. In fact, when these cases get, the Indian Child Welfare Act cases get litigated in the Supreme Court, you're always gonna have a flurry of amicus briefs. And the, the, amic the, the sort of the nonpartisan child welfare foundations and institutions that sort of follow child welfare around the country in this context always point to ICWA as saying every state should have a statute like ICWA. And it's unfortunate that it only applies to Indian people. So now you cut to this case in Texas where the state of Texas is saying, you know what, the Indian Child Welfare Act makes us, the state of Texas, do stuff we don't want to do. We don't want to give these protections to Indian families. We want to give them to anybody. We're not going to do it. And for you, to, to you, the federal government, to impose that on the state is violation of the 10th Amendment. And they've got a judge to agree with them, which is ridiculous because that the, every child welfare uh, statute in the country requires states to do stuff that they don't necessarily want to do, and, but they do it because it's tied to federal funding. And additionally, that case in Texas, the judge said, well, since the statute is only for the benefit of Indians, that violates the equal protection component of the Fifth Amendment due process clause because it's racially based. And if you'll know from our discussion about how Indian people have a special political relationship with the United States. Um, this runs antithetical to literally dozens of US Supreme Court decisions on the question of what is the import of the equal protection clauses of both the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment in relation to Indian tribes. And the courts, on almost every single case, have said that it's not a race-based race classification. There's Indian Affairs legislation is not about the fact that if people are Indians. It's about that there's a treaty relationship, a political relationship between the United States and, and their Indian tribes that requires the United States to take certain actions in relation to Indian affairs. So that's where we are right now on, on ICWA. It's, um, there is a disconcerted effort by, we're trying to figure out what it is uh, that is behind the effort to uh, undo ICWA. So the state of Texas really isn't the, the vanguard of this uh, in this case. It's uh, private entities that are tend to be funded by conservative organizations, but um, that are trying to cut down on ICWA. And if you go back to the legislative history from the 1970s in ICWA, the, the opponents to ICWA were, were private adoption organizations. And um, that could be churches, that could be private entities. Um, and I think this is, a, this is really where, where the, the push is to, to get rid of ICWA or to re restrict it, is to make it easier for private adoptions. And I don't know if that's really the case, but it seems like it's likely that private adoption is actually an industry. It's a $16 billion industry. So it's that the non-native families can adopt yeah. native children. Mm -hmm. Effectively, or really any children. I mean, but yeah, to make it easy. And ICWA slows things down. It makes it really difficult for states to terminate the parental rights. And like I said, it's a criminal trial where the parents have all of the 
procedural rights of a criminal defendant before they have their rights terminated and before the kids can be adopted out. Um, most state laws don't have that kind of those restrictions for other kids. Yeah, for any kids, yeah. I think is the point, right? Mm-hmm. 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 It's interesting. So we talked about a lot of different things today. We did. Yeah. And there's so much we didn't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's so much more. Mm-hmm. Maybe you'll join me again. Yeah, we um, But let me ask you, this is a kind of a difficult question, but if there's something that you want people listening to this, um, and this could be lawyers that practice but not in this area. This could be people that are experts in this area. Um, This could be tribal members who want to implement some of the things you were talking about today. Um, If you could tell people, one, two things that you want them to walk away knowing or feeling or something that you can do, uh, what would you tell people? That is a difficult question. You know, I I don't think, I don't know that we've done the, the, background in this talk for me to reach these conclusions. But one of the things that I really like to emphasize with students, especially that are taking my class, but really anybody, is that tribal governments are a really different kind of entity. And I like to think that in some ways they are the really the remaining true form of American democracy. Um, so much of our national and, and state elected leadership is tied to a political party, dogmatic positions that May, you may or may not agree with, um, people don't get elected unless they raise an unholy amount of money and they are dependent and are constituents of the people and the entities that give them that money. And you just don't see that with tribal governments. They are, the people who are elected at tribal government officials um, and in tribal elections, they tend to be working class people um, who may or may not have great educations. Uh, They're just normal people and they are not beholden to outside interests. And so what you see, especially in places like Michigan and Alaska, these tribal governments that are, some of them have resources, some of them do not, but they line up in favor of Indian children. They line up in favor of providing health care for all of their citizens. Law enforcement, public safety, they're serious about taking care of their people and really serious about protecting the environment. And I think that's one of the major changes since I was a kid growing up in Michigan, for example, we had just un- terrible fights, literal violence between the state and Indian tribes when in the fishing wars. Now all of those same people are on the same side of trying to protect a fishing habitat and, and the environment and they're pushing back on climate change. and way more than you would see even out of uh, more progressive liberal governments in the state and federal system. And I just wish that people knew that Indian tribes, weirdly enough, were there for you. (laughs) (laughs) I would just add also that one of the messages that I think is important for people to, to hear is that our legal system is only as strong as the way it treats its most vulnerable populations. And so there's the metaphor of the miner's canary, right? That the the canary that the coal miners would bring into the coal mines was used to test the quality of the air in the coal mine. So you'd look to the canary to see if there was any kind of change in the quality of that air. And so I know that um, Gerald Torres and Lonnie Guineer have also written about that in the context of Native people and in the context of Indian law, that um, Native people who have, uh, uh, Indigenous people in the United States who have experienced um, colonial expansion, who have experienced survival in the midst of this notion, this pervasive notion in in U.S. history of manifest destiny, um, they have done what's what's truly incredible to survive throughout um, multiple centuries in which um, non-Native people, many non-Native people have constantly tried to characterize um, Native people as on the verge of extinction. And that's never happened. They've survived throughout so many forms of forced assimilation or attempts to terminate them. And But we have to continue to focus on Indian law in one way because Native people are as... Um, at pe- those who communities with inherent sovereignty, they are very vulnerable because they're very inconvenient <laughs> um, in in a world where uh, resources resources are thought of as a as a commodity that were you know that requires um, exploitation and where native people have Indian country with vast quantities of resources 
within their territories. And we need to ensure that the legal system respects the right, fully respects the right of Native people, both in terms of their treaty rights as well as in terms of their rights under U.S. Uh, statutory law um, and constitutional law. And uh, I think that that's one of the lessons that I would want people to draw from this. Excellent. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to Reasonably Speaking. Visit ALI.org to learn more about this important topic and our speakers. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Reasonably Speaking is produced by the American Law Institute with audio engineering by Kathleen Morton and digital editing by Kristen Evans. Podcast episodes are moderated by Jennifer Marinigo, and I'm Sean Kellum. 